Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their great love for Jesus Christ were drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our guest tonight is Dr. Douglas Grandin. Is that the right way to pronounce it? That's right. So I was gonna say it's so similar to my original name, Grandin. I wanna lean that direction. Dr. Douglas Grandin, uh, a convert from uh, Anglican Church, but also with an evangelical free background. But you'll hear more about that in a second. Now, you're an important part of this program. So right off the bat, I wanna give you the phone numbers because you can even begin calling us as soon as you've got a question. 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome, one word, at ewtn.com. Doug, welcome to The Journey Home. Great to be with you, Marcus. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, we had a good chance to talk beforehand, but you know, we were, one thing we have in common is our, our commitment to catechetics, right? Is, that's, that's right. Did you, did you ever dream that you'd uh, find that your career was uh, focusing on catechetics as a Catholic? I never dreamed I would be a Catholic <laughs> <laughs> for the longest time. <laughs> but catechetics is important, right? I think it's fundamental to the mission of the church. What could be more important than teaching God's people right. about the faith? Yeah. Yeah, as Protestants, we called it the Great Commission, didn't we? Remember that? Go ye therefore. That's right. Teaching. And it isn't just make disciples and baptize, but it's teaching them all that Christ that's gives. Right. So that's, you're doing a great work, and God bless you in, in your work there in uh, Peoria. Um, uh, was that right? Peoria? Yeah, right. That's right. Let's begin, though. Every week I ask us to kind of back up and give a quick summary of your early spiritual journey, if you would. Do you know, Marcus, I had no idea growing up uh, about the church, about Christ, my family wasn't very religious, although occasionally we would sort of parachute <laughs> into church <laughs> for three or four sessions of Sunday school. And I was always lost, and I, I swore that I, I, when I had the opportunity not to go, I would never darken the door of a church again. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 13, a church, a Pentecostal church in Sterling, Illinois, opened a coffee shop on Monday night. We didn't have a mall yet, and all the shops were open <laughs> on Monday night, and they uh, thought very strategically and opened a coffee shop where they had music and uh, Coke and you know snacks yeah. and literature. And I went down there one night because I arrived too late to go to the movie and popped in down there and um, went back two more times. And the third night, someone asked me if I was a Christian. Oh. And I said yes, and then I thought, I'm not good enough to say yes. And then I said no. And then I thought, he'll think I'm really bad. And then I said, I don't know. And uh, Dan, who was talking to me, he realized I didn't have a clue what it meant to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. He came to my home for uh, several months and began reading through the Bible with me. He'd say, write down your questions. And when I was 14, in the month of November, 1972, Dan said to me in my bedroom, Doug, I think you know enough about Jesus Christ to uh, ask him to forgive your sin and to transform your life. And I said, Dan, I don't even know if God exists. And he said, Doug, why don't you just pray and say, God, if you do exist, forgive my sin and transform my life. And I said, I think I could do that. And I knelt down and I prayed a serious prayer for the very first time and asked God to forgive me. And you know, at the age of 14, I felt like God had wrapped his arms yeah. around me. And I began to weep because for the very first time, mm -hmm. I felt God's grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in February, I was baptized in the Rock River in the wintertime. We had to kind of clear away a little bit of ice <laughs> in order to, to, to get to the water. Um, that church didn't think baptism was all that important, but I'd read about it in the book of Acts. Yeah. And I said, I think I should be baptized. And they said, well, that would be a good idea. So uh, I was baptized and I got involved in that church and that put me sort of in the hinterland of evangelicalism in this Pentecostal church. And then when I graduated from high school, a missionary, uh, after I'd gone to college for two years, offered to send me to Yugoslavia to learn wow. the language. For a, it was just for a summer. And uh, that summer turned out to be five years. I went to language school, became a missionary translator. And while I was in Yugoslavia, I was exposed to a, a broader understanding of, of what the evangelical church is mm -hmm. um, and realized that I really didn't want to be a part of that particular church anymore. 
Uh, I wanted to be a part of something which was more mainstream, more biblical. That's how I was looking yeah. at it back then. And uh, I came back home, married, went to seminary, and immersed myself in scripture and did my very best to, be, to learn how to be a good preacher, a good pastor. I was ordained in the Evangelical Free Church, which is a really fine uh, evangelical yeah. denomination. You know what I want to say? I want to say that every step along my journey from that Pentecostal church now to the Catholic Church, of course, God has been good to me. Yeah. And I, I don't want to speak disparagingly right. over, you know, about any step in my journey because yeah. God has always been there for me, and you know that's true. Yeah. Um, and yet God always had something more for me as well. So uh, I was ordained after going to seminary. Um, I founded the first Evangelical Free Church in Peoria, and it still exists there <laughs> to this day where I live. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that there are Christians still growing in the faith there. And then um, I started to do a doctoral degree at that seminary, and I took a church history class. And I remember we were, we were uh, it was medieval Christianity, and we were talking about um, beginning with Augustine and and uh, St. Anselm and Aquinas. And I asked the question of my very fine professor, who do these people belong to? Are they ours? Do they belong to the Catholics? Who do they belong to? And he just said, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that really began um, a desire for more, a church mm -hmm. that, um, that was more deeply rooted in, in history. Because I was very concerned about church history uh, in addition to scripture. So, um, Luis Palau came to town, a great evangelist, and there was an ecumenical meeting of pastors at a breakfast to organize this crusade in Peoria. And there I met my dear friend, and uh, really like a father to me, um, the Episcopal Bishop Ed McBurney, a wonderful, godly man, and an Anglo-Catholic, one who um, is a successor to Newman's movement uh, before Newman left the church. Mm -hmm. He attempted to bring the Church of England back to uh, its Catholic roots in some significant way. Bishop McBurney was part of that movement. And uh, we began having lunch. And Bishop McBurney uh, began talking to me about what history tells us. History tells us that um, the early churches weren't autonomous. That's what I thought. I mm -hmm. thought that the ideal was for every church to be independent, autonomous. Then you wouldn't get into any real trouble with people controlling you from above. Uh, and the Holy Spirit could work from beneath. And he convinced me that actually the, the pattern from the beginning was uh, Jesus left apostles, the apostles ordained bishops, and there have been bishops ever since in unbroken succession. And then um, he talked to me about the Eucharist. For me and the free church, communion was something <laughs> tacked on at the end. <laughs> Preaching is what we did. We came together to pray, and, and then we preached. We had adult education and Sunday school classes, um, and we had a good time doing all of that. But communion was, because it was only symbolic, yeah. it was often done in a rushed fashion once a month, I sometimes once a, month, once a quarter, month, depends, yeah. you know, yeah. sometimes once a year. Yeah. It just wasn't important. And he began talking to me about uh, the Eucharist and the history of the church, that from the very beginning uh, the church held that the uh, body and blood of Christ once consecrated were really uh, the body and the, the wine and the bread once consecrated were really the body and blood of Christ. And so I thought, can this really be true? And you know, like many of people who've been on your yeah. program, uh, they talk about reading the church fathers and, and I began to do that and I saw it really is true. Apostolic succession um, um, and the real presence in the Eucharist. And so um, I must tell you that from my very first experience in that Pentecostal church, I had the worst kind of prejudice against the Catholic Church. Mm. I just couldn't, I couldn't possibly believe that uh, the one true church was the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. I'd heard about bad popes and all of that. And so I was very happy to, f to, to believe that um, the Anglicans represented this ancient kind of faith mm. in, in its fullness. I mean, even, even in a better way than Catholics possibly could. And I, I became um, a, uh, an Anglican, an Episcopalian, resigned my ministry in the, in the Free Church, a very happy ministry, by the way, and became an Episcopalian. And I knew that the Episcopal Church had huge problems, but I was very happy that our diocese stood against that. We were resisting that. We didn't like 
the, that women were being ordained priests or this whole movement towards homosexuality. Yeah. And so I was uh, very happy to be a part of resistance to all of that. And then I was sent to, uh, to England for a year of study before I was ordained an in, in, uh, Anglican minister, priest. Um, and it was there in England that <laughs> really... Um, the, the journey started. The journey began in earnest. All right, well let me ask you a couple questions then. Talk a bit about the um, evangelical free. And my guess is there's an awful lot of, of people in the audience that are familiar with that denomination and its origins. Uh, where does it connect into the yeah. in, into the group of Protestant denominations? Do you know the interesting thing about North American evangelicalism is that it is so distant from the the um, first wave of yeah. the Reformation, right. and the Free Church is very typical of that. It's a very, very fine Bible-believing denomination, believes in the conversion of souls and all of that. Um, but its origin comes out of Scandinavia when um, the Lutheran Reformation kind of went to seed, the churches fossilized, um, they were no longer committed to scripture or um, the, the best of, uh, of Protestantism. And then there was a, move, a reader's movement in Scandinavia where people began gathering to study the Bible. And so they thought, well, we're getting really a lot of richness to our faith in this, in this Bible reading movement. Why do we need the church? And they began ordaining their own pastors. And the free church, free from state control by the Lutheran church, uh, originated mm -hmm. in Scandinavia. And then it came over here, and the free church was primarily um, in the early years, and we're talking about 50s, 60s, I mean, <laughs> not, not, not so early as far as Catholics are concerned, but <laughs> right. as far as modern day evangelicalism, they were primarily, you know, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes. I'm, I'm, Swede I'm, I'm Danish, my wife is Swedish. She grew up in the Swedish Covenant Church. Um, and then over the years, they have, uh, because of their strong emphasis on evangelization, they have uh, broadened and they're no longer known as a Swedish or Scandinavian church. Uh, isn't James Dobson evangelical free? Or is he I, I think, I, I I heard at one point he was uh, attending a Nazarene church in California. Oh, I don't know for I sure. I was thinking that he was evangelical free, but uh, Chuck I, Swindoll was the very famous yes. uh, free church pastor, that's right. who okay. I don't think is free church anymore. But. Okay, that's right. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask was, um, did you believe when you were an Anglican, as you read and rediscovered the Catholicity of the early church and all these document uh, doctrines that you now understand as a Catholic. At the time, did you really believe that they were f being fulfilled in your Anglicanism? I um, I did. I didn't. I didn't think yeah. that the that the uh, Bishop of Rome, the Pope, was absolutely necessary. Okay. I thought as long as you respected him, um, um, you gave him a sort of priority of honor that that was sufficient. And prior to going to England, while I knew that the Episcopal Church was, was a mess, I thought that there was really a, 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 a solid core of faith which could bring about the restoration of genuinely evangelical and Catholic faith in this country. And it wasn't until England, you know, yeah. <laughs> that I, I realized it wasn't, it wasn't the yeah. case. Well, one of the questions before we go to England, um, because the biggest issue, um, for all these issues, whether it's evangelical free, as an evangelical free pastor or as an Anglican pastor, was the bottom line was how does one discover or determine if something is true? So how would an evangelical free, for example, pastor determine an issue, whether it's abortion or something determine it's true, and then later as an Anglican priest? Right. The, um Eventually, this drove me crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it, dro and it drives me crazy now. Um, but as a, as an evangelical free church pastor, because our church was autonomous, and we used to we used to um, boast that the free church was like an like an inverted um, pyramid, where the president was at the bottom, the president of our denomination was yeah. at the bottom, and all the people were at the top. You know, and the pastors were somewhere in between. Essentially, we could determine what we wanted to within, that we had a doctrinal statement, but we could determine on a vast number of yeah. things for our own church what our, what our standards were, were. And one that was always a problem for me was marriage. Because how do you handle different cases if someone comes to you divorced, 
if a, somebody wants to be a deacon, what do you do with, with this? Yeah. And there were a number of different standards and policies. And I came across a book in seminary written by some Anglicans um, and their evaluation of the early church, which, which showed that the evangelical consensus on remarriage was absolutely inconsistent with what the church had believed prior to the Reformation. And this presented a problem to me. But it was essentially you do within your own church whatever you want or whatever your, your elder board or however you're structured uh, wanted to do it, apart from the narrow, just very few guidelines yeah. that the Free Church had in its doctoral statement. Everything was basically up for grabs, but thankfully we attempted to be very biblical and not get so far away from well, there was a kind the of evangelical a, consensus. Yeah, my guess is this, you said it's evangelical consensus. There is a kind of a evangelical tradition that kind of floated there. In other words, that within you knew that you, there were certain things you didn't do. There is, it's interesting to see the evolution from fundamentalism to evangelicalism, the development of this consensus but then it's also very interesting to see it unraveling yeah. today with yeah. the ordination of women and, and social justice and homosexuality and these other things where there's incredible disagreement because there's no authority. Yeah. Yeah. I remember going to a conference before I finished seminary. It was at my, um, I think, very fine evangelical seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School yeah, in Deerfield, Illinois. Uh, it was called Evangelical Affirmations. And the big guns, Carl Henry, um, um, Kenneth Concer, uh, Chuck Colson, others came and they were trying to hammer out a broader consensus for evangelicals so there wouldn't be so much uh, difference and lack of cohesion in the evangelical mm -hmm. message and it was a huge failure because yeah. it's impossible to do yeah. without some consensus on authority. Because it was interesting you were saying, you made a comment earlier about the desire for these individual churches because then they would be free from uh, uh, oppression from above. But all it did is it just took the above and brought it down closer. Because each one had an above, it had its pastor. Exactly. You know, and so, it, and when you get all these evangelicals together, we end up all these groups with their individual popes or pastors or leaders who have to submit to a, a you know, a, a group decision. And I'll probably the problems that that is. Let me say two things, positive and negative, if I may. Positively, <laughs> evangelicals have incredible gifts. Even, our, even the documents of Vatican II yep. tell us. Yep. They have incredible gifts which are not fully operative among us, and we need to learn to incorporate those gifts which they have. Yep. I'm, I'm grateful for all those gifts that they have and which are part of my life because I was among them. But the other thing I want to say is that there are incredible deficiencies and this is one of them, this, this problem with, with authority. Um, every man doing essentially what's right in his own eyes. But yeah. because, they, because they attempt to adhere to a scripture, that saves them from a lot of problems. But there is a huge amount of unraveling, and of course when that happens, then what, what does the faithful evangelical say? He says they're not part of us, they're no longer mm -hmm. evangelical. Um, so it, it seems to me now that there really isn't an evangelical church at all. Right. There are just thousands and thousands of evangelical churches, some of which cohere together in evangelical denominations. It becomes the least common denominator phenomenon. That's right. The things that will bind the least common things, sadly, that bring them together. Then you accept the, the big. Well, okay, now you're in England. Mm -hmm. So what opens your heart to the church? There you are, an Anglican studying in England, right? With the, well, I mean, you're about ready to be ordained, right? Right. Yeah. I went over and, uh, again, uh, I, I have many good things that I could say about my very fine two Episcopal bishops and, and wonderful friends. Um, I expect that we'll be in heaven together and God will sort out, you know, the different <laughs> journeys. Um, but in England, I first went to the primary Anglo-Catholic training institution, which is part of the University of Oxford, St. Stephen's House. And there I expected to, to find a really vibrant um, Newman, Newmanian kind of, yeah. of faith. And I did find some very fine Christians there. Um, and some remain my friend to, this day, friend to this day. But I found, sadly, um, a willingness to accommodate to the ordination of women, um, some degree of homosexual presence. Yeah. And it, some of that was justified by saying, well, we're, we're, not, we're not training 
women to be priests, we're training women to be deacons, and what the bishops do, that's their business, you know, once mm -hmm. they're deacons. But I, I thought it was a huge fudge. Mm -hmm. And um, I told my good bishop that if, if, if I had to go through this to be an Episcopal priest, I'd rather not be an Episcopal priest. And he, he wisely and kindly allowed me to transfer to the Evangelical Anglican College, Wycliffe Hall, mm -hmm. which um, uh, didn't have those same problems. Um, was much more academically oriented with its very fine principal, Alistair McGrath, whom I expect, mm -hmm. respect a great deal, yep. and very, very fine people there. Um, really, the best of evangelical faith, I think. Um, strong emphasis on evangelization, scripture, good preaching, community. Um, and yet, that basically, Wycliffe Hall was very much like what I came from in the free church. Communion wasn't so critical. Um, no sense of the importance of or the, or the critical importance of bishops. I remember talking to uh, one of the leading evangelical bishops who was at Wycliffe Hall a couple of years after I left when I came back. Um, and I said, what, what, what's your opinion on, on, about bishops? I mean, you're a bishop. And he said, well, you know, if we can, if we can uh, sort of uh, get, get an Episcopal see, we'll use it for the sake of the gospel. But um, bishops, we can take them or leave them. And he was, he was a bishop. Um, <laughs> So there was something missing on both sides, and I saw there wasn't salvation for the church in either one. Um, the Church of England is the, is the cornerstone of Anglican faith, and yet the Church of England had drifted beyond anything I could even imagine. And so I came, I remember came back, and I told the, the council that interviewed me about my ordination, there is no hope coming that we should expect anything from England at all. And I was decimated. In fact, Marcus, um, um, I flew back to be ordained a deacon. And at the very last minute, I told my bishop, I mean the very last minute, the day before, hmm. I can't do this. I've got to become Catholic. And then I flew back home and talked about it with my wife. And we said things like, well, what, what God has shown us in the light, we won't doubt in the darkness. We need to serve the bishop, be faithful to the bishop. Maybe God is calling us to bring about a change. And I, I came back and was ordained a deacon, then ordained a priest, and faithfully served. But um, I, I, I was almost home <laughs> at that point. So you served at it as an Anglican. What was the final issues then that kind of brought you all the way? I mean, did, how long were you an Anglican priest? I was ordained a deacon in 90, 1999. I was ordained a priest in 2000, and I left in 2003. I served a very fine parish, one of the best in our diocese of Quincy, which is almost the same geographically as the Diocese of Peoria, where I am now, Catholic Diocese of Peoria. Um, it's important for me to say it wasn't any of those things like uh, women's ordination primarily, or the homosexual problem, or liberalism in the church, I came to the conclusion that all those were, were symptomatic hmm. of an underlying problem, um, and that God was not protecting us like he was protecting the Catholic Church from, uh, I mean, officially. Yeah. I know we have our own problems in the Catholic Church here and there, yeah. but officially, the core of our faith has, has never changed, whereas uh, with Anglicans, the boundaries were themselves were being moved. Yeah. And someone said to me, why would you become a Catholic when they have problems like what you know, we have as Episcopalians? And I said, the problems are, are of a different nature. Our problem is that the, the uh, boundaries are being moved all the time to accommodate contemporary opinion. In the Catholic Church, the boundaries are not moved, but often the standards are not applied. So it's easier for us to come back to fullness of faith than it is for an Anglican whose faith has drifted, of course, beginning with the Reformation. I think I was just thinking that if a, if a Catholic who had drifted off wanted to come back, they would know exactly what was expected right. of them. Whereas an Anglican who had drifted wanted to come back, well, they're actually going against the official teaching of their church because it had changed. So they be, they're kind of becoming a pope unto themselves. Right. deciding for themselves what it really means to be a true Anglican. I remember reading in Time Magazine many years ago as a teenager, a president, it might have been Truman, who said that, uh, that the presidency, trying to be an effective president, is like trying to sew a button on a banana cream pie. I think that describes ministry for somebody who's, 
who's, uh, who has Catholic convictions in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to sew a button on a banana cream pie. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have all these different elements who can, who can claim with almost equal authority to you that they're right. I mean, I remember when the bishop came to my, to my uh, he, he, in, it, he moved a, a woman deacon. I mean, he knew that I wasn't in favor of women deacons as an Episcopalian. He moved one of our deacons, who was a woman. And the next Sunday, after <laughs> our Sunday service, um, I got everything but, it was everything but being laid out on the floor in the sacristy. People screaming, hollering, because they knew that I was not in favor of a woman yeah. deacon. And the same thing is true with pro-life issues, yeah. um, homosexuality. Yeah. It's a very sad way to do things. And, uh, but fundamentally, and I, and I want to thank my bishop so very much, uh, who's a faithful man, he's opposed to all these things, my Episcopal bishop, but fundamentally he told me, he saw the issue, he said, Doug, um, when you come to believe, if there's any doubt in your mind that we don't have valid sacraments, that our priesthood is not valid, then you have to leave at that point. And that was the fundamental issue for me, Marcus. <laughs> uh, the validity of priesthood, the validity of our sacraments, um, and I came to have doubts about that. What was it that convinced you, therefore, you need to be Catholic, given that issue? Was it books that you read or people that you... <laughs> well, you and I share this love of uh, John Henry Newman. Yeah. Um, uh, if I go back, it, it was uh, it's probably 1991. I'd met my bishop. We were talking about these things. And I remember uh, calling up um, uh, Tom Howard, meeting with him once at Wheaton to talk about his book, Evangelical is Not Enough. Yeah. Um, and then it was reading Newman as a doctoral student at St. Louis University. I had a convert professor who uh, had me read Newman. And I remember uh, reading in, his, in Newman's Apologia, Newman says, uh, I woke up one day, he'd been doing the study of the fathers, and he said, I am a, um, a monophysite, which was a heresy, you know, early heresy. And I said to my uh, mentor, Ken Parker, he was never a monophysite. He was never an Arian, you know, I'm an Arian. He was never one of those. What's he talking about? And Ken explained to me, graciously, that um, Newman realized that the Monophysites, the Arians, they were so very, very similar to Catholics. They had priesthood, sacraments, you know? It looked just like the Catholic Church, and yet they had separated themselves hmm. from the faith and become a parallel church. And one day he woke up in the Church of England after all his efforts to restore the Catholic faith to the Church of England, and he said, you know, I'm in a parallel church, and I don't want to be in a parallel church. I want to be in the Catholic church. And so he left everything behind. Mm -hmm. So with all due respect, and all the benefits that I've received um, from um, my faithful Anglican friends and bishop, that's the conclusion that I had to draw. All right, Doug. Let's take a break. We'll come back in a little bit with uh, more from Doug and your questions for Doug. See you in a bit. Welcome back. Our guest this evening is Dr. Douglas Grandin, and he is the uh, Director of Catechetics, mm -hmm. Director of the Office of Catechetics at the uh, Diocese of Peoria. That's right. That right, a very fine diocese with oh. a very good bishop. And it's a real challenge, huh? It is. <laughs> I mean, we all know that uh, catechetics is not in the best uh, situation these days, and we're trying to recover a couple of generations that need to be re-catechized, re-evangelized, yeah. not to mention the present generation. Yeah. I mean, the danger is that we presume that once you're confirmed, you've arrived, right? I mean, that's one of the dangers. It's very and, sad, isn't you it? You know, and that people quit learning their faith. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I know I've mentioned this a bazillion times in my program, but there's a great saying by a great spiritual writer, Father Gary Goulagrans, that said, in the ways of God, he who does not progress loses ground. That's you right. don't arrive. And I think, Marcus, the saddest thing is that we don't have everywhere uh, multiple layers of adult education, um, if for nothing else, so that parents could be training their children. Yeah. There's no better model than that. Right, right. That's great. We've got a lot to do, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I'm glad you're yourself involved with it. Great. Let's take our first email. This comes from Michael in Pittsburgh. He writes, Douglas, if you spent five years in Yugoslavia, which you didn't get, did you mention that in there? Um, I did spend five years in Yugoslavia. I was a missionary. I mentioned that. Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. I was saying you get a chance very good to talk, time in my life. You didn't get a chance to talk very much about it. But no. if you spent five years in Yugoslavia, you must have had occasion to visit the many Byzantine Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches there. Did you ever consider Byzantine Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy? Why or why not? The uh, author of that email is what's his name? Robert? Michael. Michael. Michael, uh, Michael I um, not only spent five years in Yugoslavia, but I traveled to Russia for the past five years. And uh, I have profound respect for the Orthodox churches. Um, I wish that, that both lungs could come back together and breathe as one full uh, body, and I trust that will one day happen. I think that every Anglican who's, who considers uh, what it means to be Catholic probably considers uh, one of the Eastern Orthodox churches, especially if you think there's, uh, there's too much baggage on the, on the Roman Catholic side for you to you know, cross the Tiber. I thought about it, but I didn't think about it seriously. And the reason was because um, I concluded that, that the Anglicans had a problem with uh, what historians call Caesaropapism. The, the, the ruler, the secular ruler, always, you know, with Henry VIII putting, and even to this day, in, a, in, a, in some sense, putting their thumb over the church, naming bishops, which still happens in England, choosing ultimately the bishops. And it bothered me that the Orthodox churches, because they're divided by ethnic and ethnic groupings, the Russian church, the Greek church, the Serbian church, um, over the centuries, and even especially in communism, had that problem with mm -hmm. the secular power dominating the church. And I, I just, I concluded with Newman mm -hmm. that, um, that the papal office was a God-given gift to the church. And I mean, of course we have the promises to Peter. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. We don't have the full-fledged institution of the papacy early on in New Testament times, but we do have, as Newman describes so well in his um, book on the development of doctrine, we have the development of the papal office in step with the needs of the church as it becomes more of an international institution. And I think that we see this even in secular society. Who do they turn to when they want some kind of pastoral leadership? When they want to hear of the voice of the Lord, I think uh, it's clear that this bishop of Rome has, has become that person. And I think, with all due respect, that the Eastern Orthodox churches need that kind of a voice. And that's why I, I, I couldn't become Eastern Orthodox, although I have tremendous respect. They're the closest yeah. thing to us yeah. you'll find anywhere else. And we see our Holy Father working really hard mm -hmm. to, to bring those lungs back together, as you said. Let's go to our first caller, Larry from Florida. Hello, Larry. What's your question? Hello, Marcus. And I want to preface this by saying you have a, a great program. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to watch you Absolutely. every Monday. Thank and uh, I, the question is for Dr. Uh, Douglas uh, Grandin. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Grandin, um, you, you're a very articulate person, by the way, you're and I, I would like to ask you about your commentary about, uh, you made one comment about social justice, and how do you define that in terms of having been an evangelical? And I'll just be quiet and let you answer that. Thank you, Larry. Well, that's a great question, which requires a lot of attention. It's very interesting um, that uh, evangelicals now are giving more attention to social justice. There's a new book out, I think, by uh, Jim Wallace on that, which is in the top 10 New York Times list. Um, uh, I mean, the problem that I had in the past with social justice was this was often a way that liberals would, would um, it, to be charitable, they would overemphasize part of that to the detriment of, of gospel teaching. In the Catholic Church, of course, we have a balance. 
And I'm particularly concerned about the uh, life of the unborn. My wife has been um, involved in the pro-life movement. I'm very proud of her. She was the executive director of an organization called the Women's Choice Center in Bettendorf, Iowa, immediately across the street from Planned Parenthood. And they would see um, um, a couple hundred clients a year, women who were abortion-minded. They'd show a sonogram, mm -hmm. and then they would change their mind. It's a still going, great organization, worthy of support. Um, and I'm concerned about the poor, although that really hasn't been something that I've emphasized ever in my ministry. These are all proper uh, matters uh, uh, that the church gives emphasis to in its social teaching, and we give emphasis individually as we're able and as God calls us in those areas. Yeah. You know, if I could say something. Um, it's your show. You well, I know, but uh, you, the emphasis is, is you. I'm just the host. You know, I'm supposed to shut up. But uh, right along this issue, it, I look back and I remember that in the time between when I resigned as a Protestant minister and I knew I couldn't, and it's connected with kind of what you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, when you realize the orders and the sacraments and truth and issues like that, I couldn't be a Protestant anymore. But I couldn't be a Catholic, so I hadn't even thought of the Catholic Church yet. But what I did during that time is I had entered a PhD program to get involved with medical ethics. And I believed with all my heart that all I needed to be a spokesman for medical ethics was the Bible. Yeah. You know, I was going to be a spokesman for genetic ethics, all these big issues, and I wanted to help Christians understand how to apply the scriptures to these issues. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I. And I look back on that and how naive and how dangerous. Because part of the problem with Sola Scriptura is you think that it's providing a very protective boundary, but in reality, it's giving you a minimum because there's not a whole lot in the Bible about abortion. There's not a whole lot about contraception. There's not a whole lot about living wills mm -hmm. or what we should do with that woman down in Florida. There's not a whole lot about that in Scripture. In vitro fertilization. Yeah. So what happens is you have a very strong view that you believe is true and you find scriptures to back that up. Mm -hmm. So it becomes not sola scriptura, but it's your view first backed up by scripture. Yeah. And you see this with homosexuality, don't you? You, you see people arguing from scripture the case for homosexuality, that scriptures don't mean what we've always thought they meant. And so you need an authority. I remember, it's interesting you'd mentioned this medical ethics. You know, I did Christian radio and I interviewed yeah. authors for several years. It was one of the best parts of my life. Uh, back when I was an evangelical. And I had um, the very fine director of an evangelical um, um, think tank for medical ethics. They have a very fine program. Yeah. And, I, and I was thinking about the Catholic Church back then, and I said to him, why do we need an evangelical uh, program like this when the Catholics already have huge medical ethics kind of things at various universities? And he said, because ours is biblically based. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm not sure that's a very good argument. <laughs> I mean, you need natural law and all these other things apart from the authority of the church. In fact, if you're going to convince a culture that things are wrong, like abortion, homosexuality, you, you can't go to the Bible because they don't believe the Bible. You have, to, you, have to go, you have to delve more into some philosophical arguments. Um, and then, of course, for us, there's the authority of the church. Well, and over history, over time, you see in history how very deeply committed Christians committed to Scripture have slowly and slowly given in to the pressures of culture, like the issue of divorce. Right. You know, how slowly that gave, the issue of ordination of women. Mm -hmm. Where is that in the Bible? You know, so slowly, or, or the, the meaning of the family, Ephesians 5, and the whole understanding of husband and wife and that whole thing, pretty soon just given in to culture. The whole thing gets flipped. Do you know what, um, I don't know, this is probably not original with me, but I'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> I've said for years that trying to understand what the apostles taught and what the church taught in the early centuries simply by reading the Bible is like trying to watch a baseball game through the knot hole in a fence. I mean, imagine a little child trying to watch a baseball game through a little knot hole in the fence. He can only see what's, what's happening yeah. in left field. Yeah. Scripture was not intended to present a full witness to us yeah. of all that the church taught, believed, and practiced. It, it's made up of, I mean, really fully authoritative, inspired writings, but incomplete. Yep. God, that's why God gave bishops to us, to sort all of this out over time as different needs arose in the church. All right, let's go to, um, thank you, Doug. Let's go to this, this email. This comes from Sue. 
She says, good evening, gentlemen, and God bless. I am a convert from the Methodist Church. Welcome home, Sue. And will soon begin graduate studies in Catholic theology. A friend of mine and I are planning to evangelize to Protestants. Ooh, she's going to get herself in trouble. Um, we have a wonderful Anglican Rite parish here in San Antonio, Our Lady of the Atonement. And it seems to me that evangelizing to Episcopals uh, was a logical place to start. How would you suggest we do this? Thank you, Sue. Yeah, a very good question. It shows a, a, a proper heart, doesn't it, that you want to evangelize. <laughs> Um, I don't want to be silly, but <laughs> um, serving in a very faithful diocese with a lot of good parishes, I still recognize the need to evangelize Catholics. <laughs> and one of the best uh, ways to evangelize Protestants of any kind, Episcopalians or Evangelicals, is to present a truly faithful Catholic witness of what it means to be a profound Christian. Um, I. I may have been a convert to, to the Catholic Church sooner had I received more of that. Had I been inundated with one after another people who are really living the faith, who know the Bible, who can tell me what the church thought throughout its history, who are excited about evangelization. That, I think, is the greatest witness. Then again, you want to be able to answer the arguments of um, people who are uh, you know, not friendly to the Catholic Church. Yeah. That's important, mm -hmm. and there are many broadcasts on EWTN that help people to do that, many fine books. I found, again, as the director of the Office of Catechetics in Peoria, the problem is not so much good books, good programs, good tapes, it's the will, actually, to uh -huh. do God's will, and to learn, and to pray, and to fast until you have God's heart, which will propel you out into the world, wherever it may be, in your sphere of influence, to make change. I was just thinking, as you said that, the the reason the catechetics is so important is that the, the, the most um, predominant view across from sea to sea in the United States is the, the person should have the freedom to act on their own conscience. And that's not just outside the Catholic Church, that's running rampant in the Catholic Church. And that's good to a point because they forget the other part, the form. That's right. To take the time to form that conscience, which takes study and prayer and dialogue with one another listening to the church mm -hmm. to form that conscience so you can act correctly on a correct conscience. But instead, it's just conscience. Right. I, uh, the catechism is so marvelous, and on this point I think it's especially marvelous, where you have this balance between um, God's graciousness towards those who have never heard, even towards non-Christians who have never heard, potentially. They could potentially experience the grace of God, and God would act upon that um, and sort that out. That's, that's the beauty of purgatory as well, by the way. Uh, and, and our separated brethren come in there. That, you know, I am, the, the catechism is very clear to me that if, if I would have died loving Christ, not knowing at all about the Catholic Church or that I should become Catholic, I would have had a good resurrection. God would have sorted that out with me in the next life. Um, but that doesn't mean, on the other hand, we have to keep that in balance. That does not negate the Great Commission. We are to go out there and press with, with graciousness, love, kindness, press home the claims of Christ and the Catholic Church to all those who are open to hearing us. Yeah. Because we don't want to depend simply upon God sorting everything out in the next life. Yeah, yeah the, the, the operative word, I think, both in the Catechism as well as the Vatican II documents for those who are outside the Catholic Church is that God can, mm -hmm. God may, mm -hmm. in His mercy. It's not our job to judge. Our responsibility is to tell. Absolutely. And that uh, email yeah. shows a heart yeah. in that direction. That's great. Let's go to the next caller, Ken from Massachusetts. Hello, Ken. What's your question? Yes, uh, Marcus, I just love your program. Thanks. Watched it for quite a few years now. And, Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm a great guest, uh, Dr. Grandin. Um, when I was at Providence College, which is a, a Dominican school, uh, there was a Catholic priest that came, and he was a convert from a, and a priest in the Episcopal Church. And he wrote a book uh, saying that he went into the archives of the uh, Vatican and said that, um, that Anglican priests do have the priesthood and the Eucharist does exist there. And uh, just like uh, Dr. Grandin to uh, comment on that, uh, you too, Marcus. Okay, thank you. The issue of uh, Anglican orders, but also he's challenging Leo XIII's decision there at the end of the 19th century. Um. I've already mentioned that my bishop, my bishop, my Episcopal bishop, again, very fine, I love him, he's a great man, closest thing to a, a, a Roman Catholic you'll ever find in the world, I think. 
he, t he, he saw the issue clearly, uh, that one must leave the Episcopal Church if there's any doubt about priesthood and sacraments. And that became the fun fundamental issue for me. For Newman, that was the fundamental issue. Um, I, I had to act upon what I believe to be true. I'd like to believe that there are multiple branches of the Catholic Church and that, that the Anglicans are certainly one of those branches. That was Newman's view before he converted, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That there were, there were different branches of the Catholic Church and the uh, Church of England was one. I came to have doubts about that. The Catholic Church says that the Anglicans are not another branch. There, there's a defective priesthood, not a true sacrament. Um, Marcus, I came to believe if there's any doubt about that whatsoever, yeah. if I'm standing behind the altar and I'm praying over the bread and over the wine and I'm presenting that as the body and blood of Christ to God's people and I have any doubt at all, why would I want to have any doubt? Why not have certainty about it? There are no doubts at all about Catholic, Roman Catholic sacraments. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a Presbyterian, one of the things in the end that convinced me about Catholicism, I realized, well, what authority did those fine men and women have who laid their hands on me and ordained me to be a pastor? Mm -hmm. What authority did they have to do that? They were sincere. They loved Jesus. Right. But what authority did those above them to ordain them. You see, where's, That's the where's this, question, this, this issue? And the church under Leo the Thirteenth decided that when they looked back and they studied this issue that the problem was that in the 1500s the understanding of Anglican ordination shifted. Mm -hmm. The understanding of what it meant to be a bishop and, and whether the connection with apostolic, there was a shift there that put a major flaw in it. And there, there's an issue. And so as you said, there's, a, there's an unsureness and Luther had and you to want to be it. sure. You know, Luther faced it. Yeah. Um, the early generation of those Protestants faced it. But as the memory of a united church, united under bishops and the, and the Bishop of Rome, as that faded, then that became more and more of a non-issue. People don't even remember it anymore. They don't even, they don't even think it's, it's a strange thing yeah. for a person to start a new church, call himself bishop, and begin ordaining people. It's the yeah. strangest thing in all the world. In fact, I think when St. Francis de Sales started evangelizing, the very, and he started writing these letters, the first letter he wrote and distributed, the pamphlets, was this question of the authority of your pastors yeah. to be pastors. That was the, you know, who sent them? And that's, that was the bottom line issue. Let's try this email. This comes from John in Philadelphia. Marcus, why your guests always properly stress what attracted them to the Catholic Church. In some cases, what their church did drove them out. Could Dr. Grandin discuss that? Um, I was in a, a, a relatively safe diocese. Uh, the Diocese of Quincy. It's not a large diocese, but it's relatively safe. I mean, we, we did ordain female deacons in our diocese, but never um, an, a woman. Uh, there was strict moral guidelines uh, as far as homosexuality. Marriage was a problem. That's, a, yeah. that's an Anglican problem in general. But um, I could have carried on happily for a lot longer than I did. It wasn't a matter of being driven out although there, there was you know, some discomfort with all these different streams claiming authority for different, different ideas. It, it, fundamentally, it has to become a matter of conviction that the Catholic Church is more wonderful, more beautiful, more biblical, more historical than anything else in all the world. It has to be that, and not just a matter of running because the cost is so great. Yeah. It's great in giving up, your livelihood, potentially, um, your friends, your, your culture. There's a different ethos in the Presbyterian Church and the yeah. Episcopal Church and the Free Church. And then you give all of that up not knowing what will happen on the other side. Uh, and also, there, there are unpleasant things on the other side. I mean, the Catholic Church is not perfect. And when you talk to a convert, whether it's a pastor or a, just a layperson, they need to understand. They're not coming into an ideal world. I mean, the devil's active yeah. on this side of the divide, yeah. just like he is on the other. But I'd like to say, uh, as, as our time is drawing closer to an end, that when you jump, when you know the Holy Spirit has, has brought you this way, and you, you can't, it's like my wife, I couldn't do anything but ask her to marry me. I loved her so much. Uh, you know, I just wanted her to be part of my life. Um, the Catholic Church is the same. When you see it, when the Holy Spirit illuminates what the Catholic Church is, You'll pay any price. There's no cost too high. You take a leap of faith, 
but God will catch yeah. you. That doesn't mean you yeah. get your ministry back if you're a pastor as an ordained person, but God will help you. God will sort it out. And that's, yeah. we can be grateful for the Journey Home Network because you're part of God's hands in catching people. And helping the clergy come home, mm -hmm. especially. Let's take a, at least one more caller, Dinah from Ohio. Hello, Dinah, what's your question? Uh, yes, I was just calling. Um, I'm going through the RCIA process, and yeah. actually I'll be confirmed this Easter in a couple weeks. Great, I'm just, great. I was just wondering um, what it was like uh, for your guest coming through the RCIA process, and did he find a good RCIA group? Thank you, Thank Dana. you. Great question. I hope you found a good RCIA group. Yeah. Um, for many clergy, Protestant clergy, uh, bishops and priests um, often have private conversation with them rather than having them go through RCIA because they can, they can converse about the faith at a somewhat deeper level. Uh, and that's what was done with me. I'm very grateful for my very fine uh, first priest, Monsignor Dale Wellman in Moline, Illinois, Sacred Heart Parish. He met with me, he loved me, he showed me how to read the uh, Liturgy of the Hours. Um, that whole parish was so wonderfully kind to us and uh, made it very easy for us. And to, your wife came in with you, She right? did, yep. she did, and she has her own story. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we had private instruction, and then the bishop wanted us to wait a little bit longer to be received, because there's a different ethos here. Yeah. And I um, made an appeal to my priest to be received on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, because we were Sacred Heart Parish, <laughs> and he received me at a special Mass on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Vigil Mass. All right. Let's see if we get one more email and answer it fairly quickly. It could be a long discussion, but it comes from Kevin in Cor Toronto. Uh, Though Catholics long for the eventual reunification with the Anglican Church, don't you think that this possibility has grown bleaker, especially with the ordination of women priests, priestesses, same-sex marriages in North America, and the ordination of a gay bishop? Will un reunification be possible at all? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, that's a great question. I think it's not possible. I think uh, it, it, it was possible. Um, 30 years ago, perhaps, we were closer, but with the ordination of women, um, and not just the ordination of women priests, uh, ministers, but uh, particularly devastating is the ordination of women as bishops because they're ordaining people. This yeah. is gonna happen in the Church of England. The only hope would be if a kind of rump movement of Anglo-Catholics um, received a, a third province in England as they're appealing for and then negotiated something like mm -hmm. we have with that parish in San Antonio yeah. where you have Anglican right parishes in England which are affiliated with the Catholic Church. Yeah. But as a whole, uh, we're too far gone. If you're speaking now to some in our audience who are evangelical free mm -hmm. or Anglican, what would you say to them to encourage them to consider making the same move home that you've made? I would say that um, an evangelical and an, an Episcopalian should realize that to become a Catholic, you don't have to give up on Scripture. You don't have to give up on your commitment to, to evangelizing the lost. Essentially, I'm an evangelical Catholic, and I think all true Catholics are evangelical Catholics. The difference is that we have, uh, those of us who've come into the church from different backgrounds, have uh, had to come to terms with questions we've talked about, church history. The church didn't begin with the Reformation. Luther didn't start it, Calvin didn't start it, Cranmer didn't start it. The church was here. Mm -hmm. And the church admittedly was in a bad way at different times and there were, there were certain problems in the church in the 16th century we wish weren't there. But the solution to that was not to divide. Now if denominational leaders will not bring whole denominations back, which appears pretty unlikely at this point, then what the Holy Spirit does is bring us back one by one. One by one, families, we're coming back. Um, and we need to grapple then, if we're outside the church, with what it means to be outside the church. And then what the cost is to come in. And then realize that God will open doors of opportunity for us. As the church is incredibly interested in people who are committed to scripture, committed to evangelization, wanting to catechize young and old, because we're in need of that. Jump and the Lord will catch you. Trust <laughs> God, because there's life this side of the Tiber. Doug, thank you very much thank for you very joining much. us. God bless you and your work there with Imperial Diocese. Great work with catechetics, thank you. You keep up the good work. You know, Doug mentioned something there about people converting one at a time. And 
gave me a, an opportunity just to mention you've often seen on the on the, the, the graphics of the Journey Home Program references to the Coming Home Network, which is what I work with. We, we help clergy and their families come in one at a time. You may not know this, but over the last 10 years, we worked with over 1,000 clergy Amazing. from 60 different denominations. And every week, two to five new Protestant ministers contact us with interest in the Catholic Church. I emphasize that to see that something really exciting is happening now. The Holy Spirit is bringing a lot of people home. And a lot of that is because of the witness of EWTN. And thank you for your support of EWTN. So God bless you. I'll join you again next week on The Journey Home. Thank you.